Welcome to NucleCast, the official podcast of the Amlog Insurance Center. Our host is Dr. Adam Wildman, co-founder and vice president for research at the National Institute for Deterrence Studies. The NY Deterrence Center is a 501c3 organization ensuring a broader understanding of the nation's strategic nuclear deterrent and its ongoing modernization. Thank you for listening and welcome to the show. The views of the host and the guests are their own. Welcome back to another exciting episode of NuclearCast. Of course, I'm your host, Adam Lowther, and today we have a great guest who's uh, joining us from the other side of the world. Of course, I'm talking about Dr. Malcolm Davis, who is a senior analyst in defense strategy and capabilities at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute in Canberra, ASPE. So if, if you've ever heard of ASPE, that's what we're talking about. So uh, Malcolm, thanks for joining us. Oh, look, it's my pleasure, Adam. Thanks for having me on board. So we wanted to talk about the Australian perspective on AUKUS, American extended deterrence, uh, the views of China as a potential threat, how American allies in the region might play in a, you know, if there's a conflict over Taiwan. So we, we just, we had this big set of topics you and I had talked about discussing. So let me kick it off by asking you sort of a broad question in terms of how you think Australian foreign policy as it relates to the United States and to potential threats in the region, how do you see that foreign policy developing and playing out? And, you know, what are its sort of its parameters and those things that will shape it? Well, look, um, I think we've always seen the U.S. as, you know, the common phrase being used is our great and powerful friend. Um, and I think that that relationship has, has steadily evolved over the years. And it's now, you know, especially since um, the emergence of AUKUS in 2021, it's now becoming far more significant. You know, it's our one sole, sole strategic ally. Uh, I think Japan is also getting close to becoming a strategic ally in terms of a formal alliance. Um, we have many friends, but but it's the U.S. that is really critical to us. Uh, and AUKUS is, is part of that. Obviously, we fully support um, extended nuclear deterrence. We're hosting joint facilities, notably uh, Pine Gap. Um, I think Northwest Cape also continues to, to perform an important function. Um, we have, uh, over recent years, through OSMIN Dialogues, extended U.S. military access to Australian bases. So we now have B-52s that can operate from uh, RWF Tyndall, just uh, uh, just near Catherine in the Northern Territory. Uh, we've hosted the, B20, the uh, B-2A Spirit. Um, and, of course, AUKUS uh, is, is now a key part where we are going to acquire from the U.S. between three to five Virginia-class nuclear-powered but conventionally armed submarines um, with the intent then to go on to acquire this new boat, the SSN AUKUS in the 2040s. So um, Australia is one of the US's most important allies. Uh, I think that um, you know, we're the, certainly the equivalent of the UK in the Indo-Pacific in terms of uh, being that special partner, that special relationship. Uh, and it's only going to grow in importance, uh, no matter which government is in power in terms of the major parties down here. Um, we will always value the U.S. alliance. We will always work with the U.S. on a whole range of issues, um, and we stand firmly with them. And I think that that relationship is vital. It's central to every aspect of our security, and that's just going to continue to be the case. So for Australia, you, as you look north, China is much closer to you than it is to us, and it's, you know, it plays a, a central role in economic trade. How is Australia trying to, you know, it's sort of sitting between the United States and China, and and trying to balance and and you know, essentially play with both while ensuring the Australian economy succeeds. How is Australia balancing that sort of dynamic and the challenges that poses? Well, yeah, we, we used to sort of be accused of, or accused is the wrong word, but uh, 
suggested that we sat on the fence, you know, that we tried to have our cake and eat it by having a, a really good trading relationship with China and our defence and strategic relationship with the US. I don't think that's so much the case anymore, particularly after, um, you know, the period we went through with China from about 2015 onwards, where they essentially tried to coerce us with what we call wolf warrior tactics. Um, We have uh, recently uh, engaged more with China. Um, The current Albanese government talks about stabilisation, uh, you know, they talk about, you know, working with China on issues where we can, disagreeing where we must, and protecting Australia's critical interests at all times. So, yes, we are talking to the Chinese, um, but I don't think we're under any sort of starry-eyed illusions now about a future with China, um, because we recognise that at the most fundamental level, China has strategic ambitions in the region that are inimicable to Australia's interests. And obviously here we're talking about Taiwan, we're talking about the South China Sea, we're talking about Chinese influence in the Southwest Pacific um, and presence. We're talking about Chinese interference in Australian affairs. So we've gone from the period of of when we assumed that we could have this beautiful economic future with China of trade and so forth to a much more realist perspective of, yes, we can engage with them, we can trade with them, when appropriate, but they're always going to be a strategic competitor. They're always going to be an adversary in a military and strategic sense. So when you look at our um, our defence policy, really it's all about China. It's all about responding to that major threat. Both the 2020 Defence Strategic Update and its accompanying force structure plan and more recently the 2023 Defence Strategic Review focus very much on China as the challenge. Uh, and preparing for the possibilities of, of, of some sort of crisis with China. Um, the current government um, you know, doesn't want to really deal with the Taiwan issue, but they will have to at some point, um, and we'll get onto that, I'm sure. But our defence policy, our stance on extended nuclear deterrence with the United States, AUKUS, all of that is about China. It's not about anything else. Um, and so, therefore, we have, I think, this balance that is still there, but it's now a much more realistic, open-eyed balance in the sense that we're no longer under any illusions that somehow um, China is going to moderate its behaviour or become a more responsible power. We recognise what its intentions are, and we fully intend to work alongside the US and Japan and others uh, to deter China from using military force in the region. Uh, We work with the US on integrated deterrence as well as extended deterrence, um, and I think that's where, where we are at this point. So you, you mentioned Pine Gap earlier, and I'll, I don't know if you've ever watched. There's a TV, an Australian TV show. I'm a connoisseur Terrible of Australian show. TV. Terrible <laughs> show. Yeah. I think there were two seasons of it. The, the The best part was when the analysts out at Pine Gap decided that they were going to hack into the to the you know the premier of China's cell phone so that they could listen to his conversations and check his email. That was a bit. That's probably the most over the top part, but there's also a TV show and I don't recall the name and the, the underlying plot was that the Chinese had compromised, you know, Australian politicians and with some within the security services. And it was, it was sort of, you know, it was in some respects, there were American shows and it's a different adversary, but uh, you know, the, the plot was sort of similar. And so I wonder is has there been sort of a change in Australia similar to what has happened in the United States where let's say 20 years ago many Americans were optimistic that you know there would be a peaceful rise for China that we could be trading partners and that this was somehow not really a communist authoritarian regime and that it would democratize and then now Americans have very clearly say the biggest threat is China and we're focused there and and public opinion supports that has something similar happened in Australia or is there different dynamics at play? Yeah, I think broadly that the same thing has happened. I mean, uh, we've opened our eyes and realized that it was naive and foolish to assume that somehow China would democratize just because it was developing economically. Um, You know, that was certainly the hope. 
back uh, in the, the sort of the 1990s and the 2000s and the 2010s. And then, of course, um, we had the nerve to actually deny Huawei uh, the, the right to, to the ability to control our critical information infrastructure. We had the nerve to actually ask, well, where did COVID come from? Um, and we actually started to challenge, uh, you know, China on certain aspects of its behavior and policy. And so their retribution against us was swift in the form of this wolf warrior um, diplomacy where they suddenly slapped all sorts of trade bans and, and uh, uh, barriers to us trading with them. Uh, they tried to undermine our political systems. Um, and that we went in the deep freeze with China for, for quite a few years. We're starting to come out of it now, but I, as I said, I don't think we're under any illusions that this is a, 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 you know, a full restoration um, because we recognise China's ambitions. We recognise that particularly under Xi Jinping, China is far more aggressive. They're no longer biding their time and hiding their strength as they were with Deng Xiaoping. Um, under Xi, it is about the China dream. It is about a, re a re rejuvenated China that is once again the middle kingdom that's the dominant power in the indo pacific and part of that process is not only a much more capable people's liberation army uh, but also recapturing what china claims to be its territory in terms of taiwan and also in the south china sea dominating and trolling the south china sea as what it sees to be its territorial waters and i think that um you know we now recognize that you know, China does have hegemonic ambitions in the Indo-Pacific uh, that could put our security at risk, that certainly puts American and Japanese security at risk. Um, I think the, the, the legitimate question to ask is if they take Taiwan, where next? Uh, where, where do they turn next? Um, they've already been harassing uh, Filipino uh, ships in the South China Sea. Uh, there's uh, increasing Chinese assertiveness against Japan in the, in the uh, East China Sea with the Senkakus. So I think that we're cognizant of all this now, whereas before we didn't want to look at it. We just wanted the trade. And um, I think now it's a far more realistic policy vis-a-vis -vis China. But we also have our concerns about the US, I have to say. Um, you know, is the US going to be there? And we'll get into that, I'm sure. But um, our, we recognize that our strategic interests are best served by strengthening the relationship with the United States uh, and trying to manage the relationship with China as best we can, but recognizing the limitations of that arrangement. Well, you bring up a great point, and, and so we might as well just go there. And that is the idea of what is, how do Australians view, you know, the Americans are always good uh, when, when, you know, times are good, but the question for any ally of the United States is, well, what will they do when the times aren't so good? And, and when the bullets start flying and when there's, you know, loss of life, loss of these, you know, major ass, you know, $3 billion aircraft carriers, things like that. So what, what is the perception in Canberra and in Australia writ large as to what will the Americans do and what kind of commitment the Americans have? Well, look, I think that let's get into it. The key thing is Trump. Um, the key thing is if Trump gets reelected this November and then is sworn in in, in uh, January of next year, what does he do as president then in terms of critical defense relationships? He's already explicitly stated that he's going to pull out of NATO, or at the very least, not honour Article 5 of NATO, um, that should be sending bright, flashing red warning signals around the world in terms of his commitment to allies and partners, not just in Europe, but also in the Indo-Pacific. And I'm sure the Japanese and the South Koreans must have their own concerns. We have our own concerns about how we'd manage a, a relationship with a Trump 2.0 administration um, I mean, the last Trump administration, we, we um, had reasonably good relations with him, I think, because, uh, you know, he had people around him that restrained his worst instincts. Um, this time around, I don't think he'll be so restrained. 
So I, I think the concern is that uh, you could see Trump come to power and then suddenly everything falls apart. And in that sense, you know, we do have to think about how do we keep AUKUS going? Um, how do we, uh, how do we uh, essentially ensure our security if POTUS is not so inclined to protect the Aussies? Um, and that will require a substantial boost in our defence capability, uh, mitigating risk by, I think, uh, strengthening uh, the links in, you know, you have the hub and spoke system. Well, we have to build networks between the spokes to ensure that the hub is, is strengthened as well. So in other words, we have to burden share to a greater degree. That's the key point. Um, we, we have to do more to ensure that the US continues to be engaged in the Indo-Pacific region under a Trump 2.0 administration, that they recognize the importance of extended nuclear deterrence that that has to be kept going and ideally strengthened, uh, that AUKUS is critical. And so therefore, we have to make it clear to a Trump 2.0 administration the benefits of continuing with AUKUS. Uh, and I think that, you know, if, if he's in the White House, we have to work with him. Um, but there are challenges ahead, and we recognize that. And so therefore, I think we're planning for those now. So it's that time in the show where we have to take a quick break. So we'll do that now. And you're listening to Nuclecast, and we'll be right back. This episode of Nuclecast is brought to you by the Anwa Deterrence Center, whose mission is to educate Americans about the nuclear enterprise and strategic deterrence. And we're back, and we're talking to Malcolm Davis, and we've been talking about the view from Australia. Now, one of the big questions that sort of I have is, is I think back to a to a specific event in which I was at, you know, I was on the faculty at uh, Air University, the, the U.S. Air Forces, where we have all of our schools, and I was hosting the chief of staff of the Chilean Air Force, and we got to talking about the Chinese and, you know, he's essentially said, well, you know, the first time you deal with them, the deals are great. And then when they come back for, for the next round of contracts, they put the screws to you once you're dependent upon trading with them. And so, and at that time they were in the midst of trying to find new places for some of their raw materials. And so in some respects, Australia is a producer of significant raw materials that exports these to China. And, and as you've dealt with, you know, this, this balance of security and trade has, has Australia sought to diversify its exports? Has it reduced exports just in general? How has it handled balancing economic relations with security? I, th I think um, the period from about 2015 through to about 2022 really demonstrated uh, to us that we can't be completely dependent on China uh, anymore. So we have tried to diversify our trade, uh, our exports and, and imports um, uh, with other powers. So you've, you've, we've looked at much more engagement with India, with Japan, South Korea. I think Japan and South Korea in particular are, are really critical. Uh, in that regard, and also with, with you know, Europe and so forth. Um, we obviously now want to try and restore that trade with China, but I think, like you said, we recognise the pitfalls ahead, the traps that they could lay for us. So we're no longer going, you know, going into this with our, you know, uh, based on sort of starry-eyed um, assumptions about beautiful trading relationship. We, I think we're far more hard-edged and cynical about the relationship with China than we used to be. Um, but we are, I think, diversifying the relationship. Uh, we're not decoupling per se, but we are certainly diversifying and mitigating risk, recognising that things like you know, rare earths, critical um, minerals and so forth um, you know, are an important asset for our country and we shouldn't just be selling to China. Um, and we, should, you know, we shouldn't just be having a trading relationship uh, that ex focuses almost exclusively on China. There's, there's a lot of other markets out there we should be engaging with, including the United States. And I think that that we've become a little bit more sensible and mature in that sense. 
One of the things that we've seen a good bit of is, in, you know, Australia is talking to the Japanese more. Uh, President Yun in South Korea is really trying to repair the relationship with Japan. And, and I wonder, do you see, you know, there's a lot of discussion in the United States of do we need an Asian NATO? And the sort of the consensus here is, yeah, we, it, it's just not feasible. You know, we, we can't really do that. You know, the analogy, of course, you know, China is the Soviet Union, you know, then the rest of us would form, you know, this new NATO. Do you, sort of what is the Australian take on something akin to this? Is is it sort of an idea floating around there or is that sort of a distinctly American thought? Uh, look, um, I, I don't see an Asian NATO as, as that likely um, because for, for the same reason that many people are saying is that there's not that collective security dynamic in the Indo-Pacific that there is in Europe. And, you know, indeed, you know, sort of, uh, if, if we have Trump, then Europe may, might, may fall apart very quickly. But um, I think that what's more likely is a cooperative security approach rather than collective security or collective defense approach in the Indo-Pacific. So you will see closer ties between Australia, Japan, South Korea. India is coming along under the quadrilateral security dialogues. Um, obviously, the United States. Uh, some ASEAN countries, I think it's very interesting to see what's happening in the Philippines at the moment with their realization that they can no longer just coast along and assume that everything will be fine. They're starting to get their act together on defense, even to the point of you know, the Philippines and Vietnam working together on maritime security, which is new. Um, so I do think that, that there's uh, a trend in the right direction towards cooperative security. But I don't think it will end up in an Asian NATO. I think that you know most people who say it won't happen are correct. Uh, even with that overwhelming Chinese threat that's that's clear, um, the trend is more towards security cooperation rather than an attack on one as an attack on everyone. Um, there's no Article Five there for for the Indo Pacific. So as you think about U.S. extended deterrence and the nuclear dimension of this competition between the U.S. and and China and then the role that Australia is going to play in that. How, how do you and how do Australians think about nuclear weapons and, and their role? Yeah, look, you know, I think we've obviously recognized that um, uh, you know, nuclear weapons are always going to be here. Uh, the notion that somehow we'll end up in a world without nuclear weapons is sheer fantasy. It's never going to happen. So we have to continue to deal with them uh, as best we can and manage that challenge. Um, we understand that China is rapidly building up its own nuclear capacity, its own nuclear weapons cap capabilities, and that is raising some concerns about are they moving away from their traditional no first use posture and minimum deterrent posture towards something you know maybe more closer to counterforce. Um, and their, their force development would suggest that might be the case. Are they watching and learning from Russia in terms of how Russia's utilized nuclear threats in Ukraine? Uh, and could they apply something similar in a Taiwan Strait scenario to try and coerce states to stay out of a Taiwan Strait scenario? Um, so extended nuclear deterrence remains vital and probably is ever, ever more vital than before. Uh, it's only going to get more important rather than less important. Um, so we need to do more to strengthen extended nuclear deterrence in, in practical sense, but also in terms of policy engagement. We need to have an ongoing policy dialogue uh, at a high level with the United States on extended nuclear deterrence, nuclear strategy, nuclear operations. That's something that we're missing at the moment. We have you know, yearly or biannual meetings on this um but what, what is needed is a move i think towards some form of nuclear sharing now that does not necessarily imply u.s nuclear weapons under australian control it certainly doesn't imply new u.s nuclear weapons based in australia but what it could do is uh, see us working in other aspects that directly support u.s extended nuclear deterrence beyond what we do already um 
you know, I can I can think of a few. Uh, we should be doing everything we can to strengthen space security, for example, uh, to strengthen deterrence in orbit uh, to prevent the threat from Chinese and Russian counter space capabilities. And these have been topical in the last day or so with the news that the Russians are developing some sort of nuclear powered um, ca uh, counter space capability. Um, so we should be working with the Americans on how we strengthen um, their nuclear resilience, their early warning capabilities. We should be opening up our bases even more to supporting um, you know, US nuclear forces. So AUKUS is going to see um, nuclear powered submarines from the US, the Royal Navy and eventually Australia sitting in Australian ports. So let's see what we can do in terms of, of enhancing that ability to support um, US uh, Navy uh, ballistic missile submarine operations. Um, bombers I've already talked about, we should be talking to the Americans about how we host B-21 in the future. Um, and uh, I think uh, where we can plug in conventional operations alongside nuclear operations in an extended deterrence scenario as part of integrated deterrence, I think is something we should also be considering. So um, there's a range of things that we can do under what could be called nuclear sharing, short of Australia getting US nuclear weapons or hosting nuclear weapons on its soil, which I don't think would fly with the Australian people. Um, and you know, I can't see us getting our own nuclear weapons. So we have to look at non-nuclear steps that we can take that strengthen resilience and effectiveness of US extended nuclear deterrence as much as possible. Now it's that time of the show where I like to bring out Bob the genie. So as I rub my magic lamp and Bob pops out, he, of course, gives all guests three wishes, but they have to be related to the topics we've been discussing. So no world peace or no unlimited wishes. So as Bob grants you your first wish, Malcolm, what is wish number one? Okay, well, I, I do think we need to have a plan B in case... AUKUS pillar one falls over uh, for whatever reason, uh, you know, leadership changes at the top in the US, uh, inability of the US submarine industrial capacity to produce the subs that we need. So we need to have a plan B in that regard. Um, I've always been in favour of, of Australia talking to America about the B-21 as an option uh, to give us that long range strike. It would They would have to be non-nuclear, so that the, the nuclear components would have to be removed. But I do think that the 2023 Defence Strategic Review that was released down here was wrong to, to uh, essentially dismiss the option of Australia eventually getting the B-21 as a long-range strike capability. And that would, if we had that capability, that would allow us to dramatically enhance our ability to support the US and allies, including through strengthening nuclear sharing. Uh, so I would say wish number one for me would be that the government opens its eyes, realizes its error and says, hey, yes, let's actually talk to the Americans about B-21 at some point in the future. Okay, that's a good one. I like that one. Okay, so how about wish number two? Wish number two is that we do more in space. Uh, we do more in terms of ensuring Australian space capability, sovereign capability that can directly support U.S. extended deterrence. Um, the previous uh, Morrison-led co uh, uh, coalition government was, was very supportive of space. We made rapid progress. Um, the current government, not so supportive. Uh, so we're having to work a bit harder to get them to, to keep space going. Uh, I would certainly like to see an Australian government that recognises the importance of space as an operational domain in its own right uh, and fully supports things like sovereign launch so that we can directly support U.S. deterrence and U.S. forces with an ability to augment uh, and, if necessary, reconstitute lost space capabilities using Australian satellites that are launched from Australian launch sites on Australian launch vehicles. Um, I think we're heading in that direction, but it's a bit uncertain um, under the current government. So it, wish number two would be that the current government gets the importance of space and, and, and takes appropriate steps. Okay. Good one. How about your final wish? Final wish, and, and no, I'm not going to wish for world peace because I think that's that's an illusion. <laughs> um, uh, look, the final one is probably that um, 
that that we have a US that remains committed to extended nuclear deterrence, that remains committed to building and strengthening the relationship with key allies and partners in both the Indo-Pacific and in Europe, uh, that doesn't turn inwards in some sort of idiotic uh, isolationist, neo, uh, neo-isolationist moment and, and assumes that everything will be fine if, if it just walks away from its global responsibilities. And obviously, um, if that happens, key US allies, Australia, Japan, India, uh, India, South Korea, all have to work together with the US to, to reinforce that. It can't just be relying on the US for everything. So no free riding, uh, no basically depending on the Americans completely. Let's all work together as a team, but the America has to be part of that team. They, they can't just turn away and, and retreat inside you know, a neo-isolationist um, moment. It, it's not going to work. Now, before we leave, just for, you know, many American listeners, they oftentimes don't understand the difference between the United States as a nation, you know, a continental nation with 350 million people, you know, an economy of $25 trillion. And so it's hard for them to understand the difference between the U.S. and the difference between, you know, a European nation or... Australia. Can, can you just sort of set uh, a stage, give some context for what Australia is as a nation, its, you know, its size and its capability so that Americans don't sort of make this fundamental mistake? Sure. I mean, in terms of physical size, Australia and the continental US are roughly the same in physical dimensions. Uh, so to drive from Sydney to Perth, is, is like driving from New York to LA, okay? Um, but the difference there in, is population. Uh, you, you talk 350 million, I think. Um, Australia is just past t- uh, 28 million people, okay? So it's, it's a lot less populated. Um, most of the population is on the eastern seaboard and the southern region. It's, the inland is very few people. It's very sparsely populated. Uh, wildly differing in in the, the flora and fauna, the vegetation sort of thing. So a lot of inland Australia is desert-like conditions or scrub-like conditions. So it's a pretty hostile um, environment in that sense. Uh, it, it, you don't want to be out there by yourself. You, you know, every year you get stories of European tourists who think they're going to ride a bicycle from Darwin down to Adelaide and they, end, they find their bodies by the side of the road sort of thing. Um, I, I think that... Uh, Australia as a country is like the US in in terms of its social makeup. We're a multicultural society. Um, We value diversity. We we have a a huge variety of of different cultures here. You know, gone are the days uh, when Australia was primarily identified as European. Um, These days, you know, people go out for a meal and it's, it's more often than not we'll get Asian food or Indian food or Middle Eastern food. It's it's a multicultural, diverse society that values um, diversity and equality across every aspect. And I think in many respects, the US is, is sort of like that. Um, I think that uh, our politics are, are probably a little less acrimonious in some respects than the US. So there's not that partisan divide that there is in the US, which I... And that worries me about the US, this partisan divide that seems to have got out of completely out of control and is now actually undermining the ability of the US to to, to, to do policy, foreign policy, defense policy, that sort of thing. And you're seeing that now with Ukraine. Um, but as a society, you know, Australia is incredibly lucky. Uh, we have a good quality of life here. Uh, most people, I think, are happy. Uh, there are problems. Uh, we have, you know, like every other country, there are problems. You know, there's racism in, in terms of society, in some aspects. Still, um, there's uh, clearly divisions in wealth, which we need to address. Um, but Australia is often said to be the lucky country because we, we don't or we traditionally haven't in the past had a lot of security threats. That's changing now. But we are, I think... Um, 
well placed to deal with some of those threats. Uh, but we have to maintain maintain our focus on the, on these challenges. We have to have government that that deals with these challenges. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of lot of those challenges in front, um, but I think we'll we'll get on top of them. And you know, we have a lot in common with our our US partners. All right, Malcolm Davis, thanks for joining us on this episode of Nuclecast. Thank you very much for having me. And thanks to you, the listeners, and we'll see you on the next episode. Well, we're so used to always talking, you know, internally to ourselves as Americans. I thought it would be interesting to have Malcolm, who, you know, Aspie is the the largest think tank in Australia, and, you know, they do a great job. And so to get that Australian perspective and, you know, if you listen to the things Malcolm said, you can see the similarities, the differences, the concerns they have. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's always informative to hear an ally's perspective and Malcolm did that. So I enjoyed it. Hopefully you did as well. This has been a production of the Anwar Deterrence Center, a 501c3 that seeks to educate key decision makers, stakeholders, and the public to ensure a broader understanding of the nation's strategic nuclear deterrent. Our executive producer is Kimberly Charrington, and this episode has been engineered and mixed by David Grunkle. Help us grow our followers by sharing it and follow the show on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter at Nuclear.